Welcome to CERN, I'm Paola Catapano from CERN Communications and in about five minutes I'll be joined here by three exceptional visitors, three European astronauts here in CERN's data center where I'm standing right now. We are waiting for Samantha Cristoforetti, Helen Charman and Claude Nicolier who are currently visiting the CERN data center where I'm standing. Behind the glass here you can see 200,000 processors. You cannot see of course all of them, uh, they are necessary to analyze and store the data from the Large Hadron Collider, the largest scientific instrument, CERN's particle accelerator, 100 meters below my feet. That amounts to 50 million gigabytes per year, as much data as you can store on 10 million DVDs. So while the astronauts are visiting, let's take a look at this fabulous data center of CERN, and we come back right after.
Center. For those who just joined this Facebook Live, we are waiting here for three exceptional visitors, three European astronauts from the European Space Agency, Samantha Cristoforetti, Claude Nicolier and Ellen Sharman, who are right now visiting CERN. You can already start posting your questions to the three astronauts using the space just below the viewing window for this Facebook Live. Our guests are currently visiting CERN. You might wonder why. They are here with a special club, the European chapter, of the Association of Space Explorers, a sort of astronauts club. And you might wonder why they come to CERN. Well, CERN is not just the home of the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, the largest scientific experiment ever built, but it's also a, a, a place where there is a variety of experiments and a variety of control centers for experiments. One of them has a lot to do with space. It's called AMS, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. It was assembled at CERN in 2010, and in 2011, it was launched on a space shuttle mission to the ISS, to the International Space Station, where it is right now, and it's taking data. It's taking data from cosmic rays beyond the atmosphere. That's why the astronauts came to visit, to learn more about AMS. They're very curious about that, to learn more about antimatter, one of the subjects the AMS is studying, and cosmic rays. They had a visit with Professor Samting, Nobel laureate for physics, and spokesperson of the AMS collaboration. So let's now take a look, while waiting for the visit to finish, at their visit to the AMS uh, Payload and Operation Control Center a few minutes ago. And welcome back to the CERN data center. Yes, I promised you three astronauts. They're still visiting CERN. And I have here with me Francois Briard, who was with them a moment ago, and who can answer your question 
actually about the data center because this is not just about space and the astronauts. This Facebook Live, you can ask questions about CERN as well. So, Francois, I was saying we have 200,000 processors here. Uh, we don't see all of them, of course, we see some of them. And somebody, Elai Ibrahima Yallo, sent this question for you. What's the answers you are looking for by analyzing all this data? Oh, various, various questions are, are being addressed here at CERN. Um, we, we, we tried to find the Higgs and we found it. Uh, finding the Higgs is a bit like discovering America. Now we need to uh, study it and to go further. So we need to produce many Higgs and so many more data, much more data, and we need to analyze it. But there are still many other questions which remain unanswered, uh, like the Higgs boson has completed the thing we call the standard model of particle physics. And this thing explains only 5% of the mass of the universe. We do not know what 95% uh, 95 other percent are made of, and it's made of dark matter, dark energy, what particles make these, and this we don't know, and we, we need to search for. We also do not know why uh, there is no antimatter naturally in the universe, or apparently. So we are looking for that as well. So we need much more data, much more analysis to answer these big questions. So these 50 million gigabytes per year actually might contain the answer to so much fundamental questions like uh, the origin of matter, the origin of antimatter, the origin of cosmic rays even. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what, what is important is like finding the Higgs is not like discovering America. The analogy doesn't work where it's not like one time you find it. You have to show it multiple times so that you're exactly. confident enough that you've seen it. Yeah, data is extremely important. Statistics is extremely important for the CERN experiments. There is another question for you from Francois. No, from, sorry, from Nicole Morrison. My boys, 11 and 8, want to know how they can become engineers at CERN. Uh, first, work hard at school. Uh, but first, get passionate. Get passionate about what you want to do. Uh, you, you need to love your, your work, and it can be engineer in, uh, in computing, in, in uh, other technologies like vacuum, like cryogenics. Uh, we've got all sorts of engineers at CERN. So it's like do something you're passionate for, and for sure we'll have a seat for you at CERN. Engineers are actually very important at CERN. And yes, and in fact, uh, it's a thing that a lot of people do not know, but 80% of the people CERN employs are engineers and technicians. Uh, to build an infrastructure, and this infrastructure is then made available for uh, 12,000 scientists, physicists to come at CERN. The physicists are not employed by CERN, they are sent by all national institutes from all around the world. But CERN employs mostly engineers and technicians. And they can start uh, coming as students as well. Yes, we you have can, a lot of programs for students. Yeah, you can first visit CERN because CERN can be visited all year long with your school, and then you can come for an internship as soon as you start your higher level studies. Uh, you can come for internships at CERN. Yeah. And the next question is actually about visits from John. Is it easy to visit CERN, and can we see the data center? Well, you're asking the right person because he's the head of the visit service at CERN. So, is it easy to visit CERN? Uh, let's say we face three times more requests than we can accommodate. So, uh, so it's a uh, high competition to come to CERN. But yes, still, it is possible to visit CERN. So, my little trick for the ones on Facebook Live is like try to set up a group of 12 people so we can book long in advance. Uh, another thing we are trying to produce here at CERN is virtual reality right. visits of yes. those various places so you can visit them from home. And we continue doing live Facebook for you to ask. It's, it's a way of, of coming to see us. A so, way. Uh, yeah, I will try to, to go up and see if I can fetch some astronauts. There's one more question one, for one you. Question. Is the CERN data center the only center where data from the LHC is sent and analyzed? This is a very good question, very which good brings question. us to the grid, right? So is <laughs> all the data analyzed here? No, we need five times more computers. So what do we do? We share them with more than 170 data centers all around the planet. Where do we get these data centers from? It's all the institutes which have sent us their physicists who share some of their computers with us. And that's what we call the LHC Worldwide Computing Grid. So it's about half a million CPUs, half a million CPUs all around the planet analyzing the data. Maybe in your country, I don't know who, who asked the questions. In, the grid is everywhere. It's yeah, yeah, right. no, the grid is in every country participating to the LHC experiments. Right. Least. Okay. So, Francois, um, one more question by myself about the visits with the astronauts. You've been with them all day long. Were they interested in physics? Uh, yeah, some of them are astrophysicists. In yes, fact. right. So, uh, Claude is joining us. Claude Collier is an astrophysicist. Uh, so right. they are astrophysicists. So of course, they know this. They love this. Uh, but they they were, you know, astronauts are usually quite 
people who have touched the latest technology, right. uh, rockets, uh, space station, all these things. So when they come here, they it, it feel a bit familiar for them because it's also the latest technology we have at CERN. So it's very important. And they, they, they were thrilled. I think right now we should uh, make a little pause to go and take a look at how the visit is going and uh, check if we can grab at least one of them down here because I'm sure there are many, many people there uh, on Facebook waiting for them and uh, wanting to send their questions in. Stay so tuned. let's take a little break. Uh, we go to grab an astronaut and we promise you to bring one here. They're out of the visit. Sorry for that. I know you're very interested, but we have we have to repeat again. <laughs> okay. Welcome back to the CERN Data Center. I promise you an astronaut. I'm here with uh, my preferred one, Samantha Cristoforetti, who was visiting uh, with her fellow astronauts uh, just uh, one one step above us. Thank you for joining us, Samantha. I'm. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm particularly glad to to have you here. 
because I actually was at the soup when you were being launched on the 24th of November 2013. It's following your, yes, <laughs> following your launch, it was really the best emotion of my life, really. What's your best memory from the Futura mission? Well, let's see. I am not a person who likes to do rankings of experiences. I don't have a favorite experience and the least favorite experience. I had a wonderful flight. I spent 200 days in space. Some moments were uh, extremely exciting. Uh, some moments were routine and boring. Everything. It's like six and a half months of life and like normal life. Uh, it's complex and I like to embrace it as an experience as a whole. And it was just a great, great time I had up there overall. Fabulous. In addition to being a record woman in space, because you are the, the woman who has the longest duration permanence in space, 200 days, and the first uh, European to do a long, female European to do a long, uh, long mission in space, you're also a Top Gun, if I may say so. Just before we were watching the video of a crazy drone, a race drone that was whizzing through the data center here above the computers. So my question for you, and then we go to the question from the public, was is which is your preferred aircraft? The Soyuz, the T-38 or a fighter jet, or maybe one day a, something similar to the space shuttle? <laughs> well, let's see. The, my preferred uh, vehicle is probably uh, the cool uh, spacecraft that I have not flown on yet. So who knows what will come in the future? <laughs> yes, OK. Your, your mission was called Futura, and you're always looking at the future, obviously. So I have on this iPad questions for you coming from our Facebook audience. Uh, first question is, uh, on the importance of a specific number, number 42, <laughs> for your mission. Can yes. you tell us more about this number? Well, for it was the answer, of course, to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Well, it's, it, it's uh, of course, a quote from Douglas Adams in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I uh, flew to station as part of uh, Expedition 42 initially, then I became 43. Uh, and so, of course, it was natural to me as a science fiction fan and Douglas Adams fan to um, play a little bit around uh, yeah, this. Fabulous. So, um, don't panic was our motto during our, our, our space mission. And you see another question here. Among the many experiments you were carrying out on the ISS, one had to do with Italian coffee, believe it or not. Is it true? And can you tell more about that? Indeed. Uh, um, yes, I was up there when um, the um, first uh, space express machine was delivered to station. It's called ISS Espresso. And uh, yeah, very, very unique piece of equipment um, that, by the way, is going to be uh, reused again uh, now after a couple of years uh, by Paolo Nespoli, the next Italian flying to space in a couple of months. So we are looking forward to see and to hear about his impressions of uh, espresso in space. And how does coffee taste? Up there, <laughs> in zero-G. <laughs> oh, coffee is great. I mean, I'm, I'm a big coffee drinker, so <laughs> great. We have a question from Stephanie Jean Marchioni. Do you feel changed by your experience in space? Has it impacted you in any way? Well, of course, the simple answer is that any experience, of course, enriches you and changes you, right? And, and space is no different in that sense. If we are talking about some kind of uh, dramatic change where, you know, you fly to space and you come back a completely different person, no, not at all. I, I, I do not think so. But of course, it's an experience that has enriched me as a, as a human being, as a, as a professional. Um, and of course, it was also the, the great dream of my life. So before flying to space, I think I was always a little bit on a race to actually make it to space because that's something I really wanted it's a to achieve. Race. <laughs> Very few managed to, to go right. to space. And so <laughs> having achieved that, I guess, it, you know, now I, I, I maybe have a more calm, calmer attitude and towards life. <laughs> I, I guess you're hoping to fly again. You're still an yes. active astronaut. I, I'm definitely an active astronaut. I, I hope to fly again. But of course, hoping for your first flight is definitely not the same as hoping for your second flight. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question from Divania Antora. Did you have a hard moment in your astronaut career? Uh, well, maybe a little bit of a disappointing moment. Um, actually, just a few days before flight. Uh, one of the things that I was really hoping to, to be able to do in space was a spacewalk because it's, you know, it's something very special and it's also something that I had trained very hard for. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a small sized person, so for small people like me it's especially difficult because the suit doesn't really come in a small size. Um, and so it had something, again, something I had really worked hard for and then uh, about a month before we launched, 
a cargo ship blew up, which contained my gloves and some um, tailor-made oh undergarments for EVA suits. And they're custom while, made, right? They're custom made. I mean, there are backups, and for a while I kind of assumed that there were going to fly my backups. But of course, the program managers had to make choices about how to use the space that was left in the up, the upload opportunities. And of course, the priority was for experimental equipment, uh, replacement parts, and stuff like that. So. A few days before launch, I learned that those replacement equipment for me would not be flown, and that was probably the yeah the, the, Big the more disappointing <laughs> disappointing moment. Let's Maybe say. next time. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the good thing is that I definitely have something great to look forward to maybe for my next flight. Mm -hmm. Also, today you learned a lot about AMS from Professor Samting, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, a cosmic particle detector that does the same job as the LHC, but it does it beyond the atmosphere, on top of the, uh, the space station, with real cosmic rays, not the one that we make in the machine, which are the same, but coming from space, they're higher energetic. So one day maybe you could repair AMS if necessary, or do <laughs> some operation. On AMS? Well, what, what I understood from Professor Ting is that uh, there might be some repair work uh, planned for uh, um, not so far in the future. So it's definitely not going to be me because that's going to be definitely before I get a, another chance to fly to space. Um, and then I think uh, the hope is that AMS will not need any more repair for a very for a long, long time. time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Question from Gada Shokani. What obstacles, I might add, if any, did you face as a female astronaut? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's always very hard to um, answer that question because, you know, n none of us comes to this world having a chance to do both experiences, like, right? You're either a female or a male. And so, uh, you know, whatever difficulties I had, I cannot tell whether it was because I was a female or just because there are difficulties in life. <laughs> so yeah. it's very hard to answer that question. Yeah, probably nothing specific. Probably at knows? a certain level, male, female, whatever you are. It's, it's the same. What counts is the competence, what counts is what you can bring to the mission. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it's an illusion, I think, to think that people relate to you in a gender-neutral way, right? But it's also, I think, probably safe to assume that sometimes it's a slight advantage and sometimes it's a slight disadvantage, but kind of overall, probably they cancel each other out. It's kind of my assumption, but I don't know. I mean, there is no way to verify all this. <laughs> And now, one last question from Claudio Bortolin. Hi, Samantha. What would be the message for a little baby girl like my daughter to inspire as a possible future astronaut? That's a nice message to finish the interview with you. Um, you know, I, um, I grew up dreaming about flying to space since, since I was a child. And, you know, I can share some of the things that maybe inspired me. I don't know, because it's really hard to, to know exactly what goes on in, in, in the mind of, of a child and, and to remember it correctly as, a, as an adult. But, uh, you know, I, I was fascinated by the, by the sky, so bring her out and, and let her be fascinated by, by a starry uh, night sky. Um, let her be adventurous. Let her play on her own. Let her test her strength. Um, tell her about science. Science not as, a, as answers, but as questions. I mean, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that even, you know, very young children, even preschoolers, they can be fascinated by, by the interesting questions out there. Uh, certainly, space is fascinating, and your adventure is amazing. It's a historical feat. Thank you very much, Samantha, for being with us. Thank and you. I'll let you quietly go back to your visit of CERN. All right, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. So we now have another female astronaut, a pioneer of space exploration, Helen Sharman. Welcome to CERN. Thank Welcome you. to the CERN Data Center. And uh, thank you for being with us uh, tonight. So as I was saying, you're a pioneer in space. You flew when you were just 27 <laughs> in 91. And uh, you were also the first Brit in space. So my, my first question for you recently, another British uh, young astronaut was uh, working on the space station, Tim Peake. What are you following his flight, his mission, his launch, all his adventures in I space? We were all following Tim Peake's launch in space. So just like all the Italians were following Samantha in space, right. I think in, even though it's an international effort and it's an international space station, it's still quite a, a, a national thing. We get national pride out of our own people flying. So yes, we, we were all very proud of Tim. I can imagine. Were you nostalgic about your own flight? It brings back memories, of course it does, and not that you ever really forget, but um, I was asked to recount them again, and um, yes, right. it brings it all All, all the emotions really are back. Because yeah. um, when you remember those feelings, just like when you swim, you know what it feels like to swim, and even though you might not be swimming now, you can imagine what that's like, cycling a bike, 
feeling weightless. So I now know what it's like to feel weightless. And sometimes I dream about it even now. Yeah, we've already got questions for you. One coming from Wenche. Hi, Mas Vindal. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Can you remember the first time you had an interest in space? I remember when I was very young at school. Um, it was the time when the Apollo launches were all going off to the moon. And we were told at school that we had to make certain pictures of these rockets. And it was, at the very beginning, it was a bit interesting. And then after a while, it got as so, though, oh, we're not another rocket, and we've got to talk about rockets again. And so it was just, it became a little bit, oh, boring, and other people do that. And it was never going to happen to people in my country. British people don't go into space, and certainly <laughs> it wasn't going to happen to me. So I didn't really consider it as something I could be involved in. Crazy. Until I actually heard of an opportunity where they really did want a British person to apply for a British mission to work with then the Soviet Union, the Soviet Space Agency, and go to the Mir space station. Right, and you were the first European actually to, to go to the Mir space station, which is the mother, so to say, of the International Space Station, was the orbital complex of uh, the Soviet Union at the time. Yes, I mean, a lot of the International Space Station now is based on the original technology that Mir um, pro um, developed and also progressed while it was there. Certain um, small, small parts of the station are, as, as was originally developed, but the main base base block, the main living area, um, is very, very similar to the Mir station. Yes, yeah, so when, when I go through a kind of a mock-up of the ISS, right. it's a bit like going home. Yes. Was it smaller, the Mir? Much smaller, yes. It was smaller, um, a lot noisier, and a lot more basic. I mean, the biggest change, actually, has been the communications. So now on board the International Space Station, the astronauts have a GPS phone, so they can phone right. home whenever they like, and they can use email and communicate in that way, and they get all the communications. They can they, they find out about the news items going on on the ground. Right. But they in, read newspapers, in yes. In 1991, the internet, you know, was, it was real. It was starting here, actually. Absolutely. <laughs> we just saw about this in the data center yes. here at CERN, so really interesting. Um, so, yeah, we had, um, we had radio communication with the Earth, and that was it. Every um, day? Um, every day to mission control, but only while we were over Russia. So once we got east of Russia, Crazy. over the Pacific Ocean, we were out of contact, which is quite nice, actually, <laughs> because the mission control isn't always bothering you in space. Right, right, probably um, now it's happening. <laughs> if, I think if you're in space, actually, for a long time, seriously, so there were, before I arrived on the space station, there were two people up there who had been there for six months, just two people. So I think if you're thinking about that without the communications, that's really tough. So I've heard it compared that Mir space station was a bit like going on a family camping trip compared to the International Space Station, which is like going to a full luxury hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. There's Bob Rogers who's following us and he's asking, did it take long to be reacquainted with gravity on your return? Sadly. The human body readapts so quickly. And I've been in space for only eight days now. I think if you've been in space for much longer. Like Samantha can, for six yeah, months. Samantha for six months, Tim Peake for six months. Right. It can take actually much longer. It can take actually years for your bones to actually um, get back to the. And lots density. of exercise. Exercise and nutrition, of course. But um, apart from, but I mean, of course, after a, a few days, the astronauts probably don't feel that their bones um, haven't got the, the right bone mass in them. Yeah. But um, th the biggest thing is the balance. So even when I, I returned to Earth, although I felt heavy, Every time I moved even my little finger, there were signals going to my brain to say that my little finger had weight now. <laughs> and so very quickly you adapt to that. But actually yes. walking, I was walking in a wobbly line because my leg felt heavy. So you know when you lift up a heavy bag, you want to, to lean over. So I wanted to lean a little bit when I lifted up my leg. So I was walking in a kind of a wobbly line. And it took <laughs> a few paces to actually teach my brain that I didn't need to lean over each time I lifted up my leg. Crazy. Jerome Diego Orant, um, is there a lot of physical preparation to do before going to space? There is still quite a lot of physical preparation because you have to be um, the main thing is healthy because you don't want to cut short your mission because you get sick in space. But actually, still, people need to be reasonably strong to get through not just the G forces that you expect, but if something goes wrong, if you do a ballistic re entry, for instance, you might get 8G. That's, that's quite that's what tough. You've got? I didn't get 8G. You know, and usually we get about 5.5G on landing in that's Soyuz. Quite a lot. And that still feels quite a lot, especially if you've been in space for six months. Right. So, so I think. You've been yes. 0G and then all of a sudden you get 5Gs. You would never get that so on Earth, would you? Working with that, um, the, those sort of G forces and also working inside your spacesuit. Um, so we even did yeah. exercises with our hands to make our hand muscles strong. So if your spacesuit inflates with air, if you lose the atmosphere, 
from the spacecraft, so not even doing a spacewalk. So if your spacesuit inflates inside the spacecraft, then right. it's difficult to just move the, your fingers in the gloves. That's you wear during the trip, right? Yeah. But not on the station. No, on no, the mirror, on, you on wear. So you wear the spacesuit. As free as on the ISS. Yeah, just for the dangerous times of launch and docking and landing. Right. Bella Raya asks, what will be, should be the primary quality that a woman requires to be a successful astronaut? I would say the primary qualities are just the same as what anybody requires to be a successful astronaut. And nowadays, um, the, I mean, it's a warm thing. I would say there's probably a combination of things. Still, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be a real logical understanding. So it doesn't necessarily have to be engineering um, abilities. Degree, yeah. But I mean, for instance, my degree is in chemistry, so I'm a scientist. But I think it's the understanding so we can work out what to do in situations. But actually, I think just as important as that is the ability to work well with your colleagues up there. So it's to be a team worker. You're working with your team in space, with all the teams in mission control, with all the doctors, all the scientists, and you're just one of a huge team of people and and different you, cultures especially yes, in your case and learning different languages for instance so that's also important speaking Russian okay last question from Daniel Dempsey humans are in times where we are at our most our, our most advanced where do you see the future for CERN that you just visited oh, wow. and collaboration with space? Wow, so the future for CERN, that's a, that's a, we've been a because I've only seen as an a very small part As an external of person. But yes, absolutely. So we've, um, we, today we saw the, uh, um, the, the um, alpha magnetometer spectrometer and, well, not the real thing, of course, because that's in space. Yeah, you saw um, the control saw, center. The control center, which is absolutely fascinating and um, sort of heard about just a little bit of the science that they're uh, getting from this. And so things like that. So we're using space all the time. And I think it's an interaction now. We don't separate spy space from Earth. We're using space on Earth all the time. We were just hearing about some of the uses of space for um, the United Nations. Satellites, of course. And, yes. um, and, and really helping people's um, life on Earth. So I think we don't separate anymore. Just like you can't separate science from life, you can't separate space from Earth. We are part of space after all. We are, you know, in our planet, we are floating in space. So um, there we go. We, we're all part and parcel. So it has to be integrated. Thank you very much. That was a very nice conclusive message from Helen Sharman, UK first Brit in space. Thank you, and I'll let you go back to the visit. And we have here our next astronaut and final astronaut for this Facebook Live from the CERN data center. Somebody who is uh, very close to CERN. Hello, hello. Bonjour, Claude. Uh, bonjour. We continue in English. That's fine. Uh, very close to CERN, not just because you were born on the shores of Lake Geneva. That's right. But also because you're an astrophysicist. That's correct. And today you were visiting the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer headquarters together with uh, Professor Sam Ting. Yes. What was your impression about uh, the AMS? Well, this is a wonderful achievement uh, by the team here at CERN and, of course, many other institutions. But, uh, but, but, but the heart of, uh, of AMS is here with Professor Ting and his team. This is an incredible uh, achievement, really. This is wonderful. It's been collecting a lot of data, and he's going to collect uh, more data for the next uh, seven years or so until the International, International Space Station is going to be taken aside. And I don't know exactly what will happen with it, but uh, at least for seven more years, we'll have good data from uh, AMS. Yes, so talking about achievements, so you were part of the first European Space Agency selection, Great. one of the astronauts selected the first time by a European space agency, and you were the first European space walker. Today, I think Peggy Whitson has, is having right now, like we're talking, a spacewalk right. on the yes. station. And probably she's having to intervene on, on the AMS. Do you know anything about her spacewalk right now? Uh, I have to confess I don't know. I, I personally never was on the International Space Station. My spacewalk on the, was on the Hubble Space Telescope in uh, uh, 1999. That was the third servicing mission of the Hubble Space Telescope. I know a little bit about the International Space Station, but I never went there. So the detail of what she's doing with her colleague is always two person going right. uh, out at the same time. I don't really know the detail, the little truth. But the, we had, as we were coming out of... Uh, um, one of the facilities here at CERN, we saw uh, on, a, on a TV screen uh, some views of the space walk. Live so, from the ISS. So live, so everyone stopped there. We needed to continue, but everyone stopped because obviously when there's a space walk, everyone is looking. And um, would you, if you were given the opportunity, would you do that again? You, you repaired, you did one of the missions would, to repair the Hubble. I would love to, of course. Uh, obviously, being an astrophysicist originally, uh, having the opportunity to work on Hubble was, was very precious for me. I would have liked to go to ISS. The advantage of ISS is uh, the missions are much longer. Uh, the shuttle missions were short. They were very typically intense. 9, 10, 11, 12 days. And uh, when you were going back after working every day intensively for uh, about that amount of time, 
a little more than a week. You wanted to stay there longer <laughs> and take advantage of the uh, profit a little bit, yes. Uh, <laughs> but we had to come back. Uh, so it was a different style of uh, space flight compared to ISS, but it was always very rewarding, especially all the servicing missions of Hubble were all successful, so that was wonderful. That's amazing, yes. Yeah. There's a question from Iki Panteri Manceros. Would it be more beneficial to build a particle accelerator in space rather than under our feet, 100 meters below ground? Well, I don't really think so. I'm not an expert in particle physics. Of course, we've learned a little bit uh, about uh, it uh, today here, but uh, I don't think that it would be an advantage to, to be in space. In space, of course, you have uh, uh, zero-g conditions or microgravity conditions, but I don't think that for a particle accelerator this is significant. There is already, the cosmos itself is a particle accelerator, right? And that's what the AMS is profiting from. Is uh, absolutely, yes. Well, it's not really a particle, it's a particle detector, let's say, for... No, but the, the cosmos. Oh, the cosmos itself, Is an accelerator. Yes. It is, if that's you, true. If you yes, may. Yes. Uh, much more powerful than anything we can do. It really build. is, yes. Yeah. There is a question from Daniel Dempsey. What, what, do you, what do you get up to in your spare time in space? What do you do well, in your spare you, time in space? Of course, every mission has a set of goals that we have to accomplish during the... Again, for the shuttle, it was uh, typically 10 days in space. And uh, every mission had a, had a different goal. If you have to go and fix Hubble, uh, replace the main computer, replace one of the fine guidance sensors and uh, change gyroscopes, then you do this. And I remember that the crew was always obsessed with the idea of being successful on the mission. So we, were, we really wanted to be successful, and we were. Uh, but you go up there, of course, you enjoy the wonderful environment, uh, the weightlessness and uh, the views of the sky and the earth, which are always enjoyable. But most of the time you just work. Yes, uh, right. And uh, mm -hmm. it's always very, uh, very rewarding when you, do, uh, you are assigned to a mission, you work, you train for about one year, you have a mission, again, about 10 days in space for the shuttle. And then if you're successful, it's a huge reward for us. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claude. Uh, some people are making signs that uh, I've stolen enough of your time. <laughs> Actually, it was a fantastic opportunity to have three astronauts here. We've, uh, we've taken this opportunity really last minute. I hope uh, the Facebook audience has enjoyed. I hope your questions were all answered. And otherwise, see you next time on Facebook Live from CERN. Thank you, Claude. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Pleasure. Thank you.